maybe without further ado, um, we would like to start this event. Um, my name is Aiki Harahant. I'm Associate Professor at the University of Tokyo, and I also direct International Law Hub at the University of Tokyo. I'm very pleased to uh, be a facilitator of this conversation between a very established uh, um, people who are working on issues, these related issues, and uh, the youth who have been really very um, impressive in uh, moving this, um, this uh, activity forward um, to get voices of the people who are affected by this to the world. Um, now, um, I would like to just highlight a few things um, and then I would like to invite the keynote speakers to, uh, to this event. Um, I think um, the world has woken up to this, uh, what is uh, called refugee crisis um, in uh, the, quite recently, even though this migration has been going on since the history of humanity started. Um, I think what, would what you would have in mind is the global compacts on refugees and migration that, uh, that was agreed in 2018. And then eventually this global forum to discuss these uh, global issues. I think it is very um, progressive in a way that it is all stakeholder approach. So we are not no longer just relying on a few willing states, but also states who have not been very active in thinking about this issue and also non-state actors. Um, and I think that was one of the very progressive moves that this um, issue has seen in the recent years. Another thing I think is very progressive is the responsibility sharing. So um, I think those states who have been very willing to um, cooperate in this issue um, have uh, come to uh, the limit of um, doing good things in their words, probably, um, good things on their own. So now uh, we are thinking about responsibility sharing. I think it's one very big progress that it has been acknowledged. I think this will mean that we can no longer be um, uh, silent bystanders on this issue, including us in the academia or us in Japan. Um, so in this occasion, I'm very, very happy to see that these conversations are, um, are happening. Uh, in a contemporary uh, contemporary world and contemporary way. Um, I think one issue that I would like to add to uh, this forum before inviting uh, the keynote speakers is that uh, the thinking about refugees is a little bit old. And I say this with a little um, um, a bit of a danger <laughs> that would probably, um, you know, um, thinking about this word refugees. Um, I have a lot of discussions and a lot of students researching on these issues um, for a long time. But it seems that refugees are, talk, uh, are talked about in many different ways. Um, one context is anybody who is escaping from something in a home country. Another context is those people who are seeking protection in another country. Another um, category seems to be migrants in general. And I think it is uh, probably quite conservative to think about refugees in a sense that is defined in a refugee convention. Um, nowadays, I think it is probably more appropriate thinking, think about those people who need protection and cannot go back to their country or cannot even go out of the border of Japan or in any other hosting country as forced migrants. Um, forced migrants have a lot of different legal categories, legal status, or um, different reasons for them to be in another country. But what is uh, common is that they have um, risk and they need protection. And I think for that purpose, um, Dr. Hashimoto's uh, research, um, I was very impressed by her research, that basically talks about what makes states to decide, um, what, what makes states to decide uh, to admit refugees. One is about protection needs, another one is about integration prospect. I think uh, Japan is pictured in that research as one of the countries 
that takes integration prospect as most important factor and not protection needs. Um, I think this is probably quite an um, uh, important point to think about, to see who are those people instead of who do we want. Um, that is a protection focused idea of uh, forced migrant uh, policies. And uh, as I was listening to another uh, seminar before coming to the seminar, um, whoever is having a problem, whatever um, bad things happen to whoever, it is bad wherever it happens. So I think um, in that sort of relation, um, a human rights law may provide some help in understanding this sort of prospect. Um, and uh, when we talk about refugee issues, we tend to think about refugee law and immigration law. Um, human rights law will provide a little bit wider um, uh, framework in that anybody who is under the jurisdiction or in the territory of that country is under the protection of this state. So in that sense, anybody who is in Japan currently is under the protection of Japan, and that is Japan's responsibility. So I think uh, that's probably something that I would uh, offer to this forum to think about. And, uh, you know, there are lots of discussion that we can do uh, with regard to what do you mean by jurisdiction? What do you mean by the territory? Um, but it is uh, very important for people who are involved in migration issues and also uh, those people who are um, working in this. But also, um, all stakeholder approach means that everybody who is concerned about the issue have a say in the matter. So um, that's what I would uh, open this forum with. And uh, maybe without further ado, if I could uh, invite, um, introduce the keynote speakers and invite the first keynote speaker. The first keynote speaker we have is Professor Saburo Takizawa. He's been working on this issue for a long time, over 20 years, I believe. And he's a professor emeritus of Toyo Ewa University and he's former UNHCR representative of Japan. So um, without further ado, please, uh, Takizawa Sensei. Can you unmute? I forgot to okay to demute. Thank you for all for this um, occasion, Professor Kihara Han. And I'm happy to be here to exchange ideas with some um, particularly young people. Um, my time given is only 10 minutes. I will use some PowerPoint and um, um, Okay. I'm going backward. Okay, Japan's refugee policy, past, present, and future. Uh, can you see the slide? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. Now, um, the first one is uh, this diagram, which shows uh, the, the structure of uh, the international protection regime. There are basically two elements, two dimensions. First is asylum. Asylum. Um, providing assignment to refugees arriving on the shores of um, a country, host country. And second one, and um, in my view, which is very important, is the burden sharing. Uh, for example, uh, Turkey has uh, almost 4 million um, Syrian refugees, and um, the country is suffering from uh, tremendous burdens. And the international committee decide to share the burdens. People may call it responsibility sharing, but I call it burden sharing. We have to have uh, um, both in mind. Asylum and um, um, burden sharing are two important 
key components of the um, international protection regime. And with that in mind, um, let's look at the profile of Japan's refugee policy. Um, there are two dimensions, asylum and burden sharing, which is also uh, broken into resettlement and financial contributions. In the case of Japan, the asylum system is almost dysfunctional and impact on the international protection of refugees is minimum or almost zero, a drop in the ocean. Now, resettlement, um, the program was started in 2010 and has been growing. Now, um, this year, the government intend to accept up to 60 um, refugees from Asian countries. Um, on top of that, um, the government has been implementing a program to accept Syrians, Syrian students, not as the refugees, but as the students, um, a total of 150 students plus their families in five years. Uh, out of 1 million people who need resettlement, this is uh, small, so it's uh, still symbolic. Now, uh, when it comes to financial um, contributions, Japan is playing a um, rather important role. Being a former UN share controller, I know how precious it is to, to receive, say, $150 million or $200 million from the Japanese government, which saves millions of people. Millions of people's lives are um, um, saved by this amount. We need not forget, we should not forget about the importance of financial contributions. Without money, you can't do much. Now, it come to, when it comes to asylum in Japan, um, this, is, um, this shows um, rather um, 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 an impressive picture. The number of asylum seekers has been going up sharply till um, um, it reached some 20 in 2017 and came down, dropped to now 4,000 last year. On the other hand, the number of um, refugees granted, uh, um, people who are granted refugee status has uh, fluctuated uh, from 10 to say 50. Last year, the number was 47. So it's very small. The, um, the question is why we have such a um, sharp increase in the number of asylum seekers and why Japan has been given such a small number of refugee status uh, over the last decades. Why sharp increase in the applications first? Um, basically, some, um, the asylum system has been, say, uh, misused or abused or utilized by the economic um, um, migrants um, uh, from uh, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, uh, in, until 2010, um, the um, asylum seekers who are not allowed to work. And uh, because of the pressure from the NGOs and the civil society organizations, the ISA, Immigration Service Agencies, decide to grant unconditional work permit to all asylum seekers after six months of uh, their claim. And this was an um, um, opportunity for many of the um, say, um, people in the, in the Asian countries, as well as the Japanese um, employers. Um, and then um, every year, 50% uh, more asylum seekers apply for asylum. And um, the system almost broken, broke down. And then because uh, the system was almost uh, broken, the ISA stopped unconditional granting of work permits to all asylum seekers, uh, or to say, um, to say people who have unfounded, uh, unfounded claims. Uh, and then the number drops sharply. On top of the, there's some change in policy, the corona uh, pandemic um, reduced further the number of applications. Last year, the number was only 4,000. At the same time, the government is implementing a new immigration policy whereby um, unskilled workers who have been um, not accepted in the past, now the government is accepting unskilled foreign workers. 
And this is changing the, uh, the landscape. Some, if not all the asylum seekers who want to work in Japan can apply for the new um, immigration um, system and uh, the specified skilled worker system, SSW system. Um, but we have to see whether this um, uh, will change the, the, the immigration um, um, policies and practices. Next question is why a small number of recognition? Um, there has been a lot of uh, attention on this issue and um, a lot of debates. Um, the first reason is obviously geography. Japan is far away from uh, um, Africa and Middle East countries where uh, conflict continues and a um, large number of refugees are produced. Then, Japanese language barrier. Very few people want to come to Japan because they know that they have to learn Japanese. And the refugee communities are small and they can't offer um, assistance to newcomers. Another is a reputational problem. Um, this is Reuters um, um, headlines. If you are a refugee, don't even bother with Japan. Such an article is issued every year in February when the Immigration Service Agency publishes on the statistics of the previous year. Um, if I were refugees, I would not think about um, going to Japan because the writer said, don't come to Japan. We have to think about the role of uh, the foreign media as well as the domestic media. Second reason is um, well known, the refugee status recognition criteria, criteria are very high, very tough. Uh, as uh, Carlos has said, uh, the refugee convention is um, 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 targeted uh, at rather small or uh, um, small number of people, uh, basically political refugees. The, the refugee convention network is very rough. There's plenty of uh, the holes. They can't, the refugee convention can't help everybody. Nowadays, um, there's a growing number of, say, conflict refugees and people who are fleeing from new forms of persecution, such as gender-based violence. But the ISA maintained a um, narrow interpretation of the refugee convention. Instead of giving um, a refugee status, they provide um, humanitarian status. Uh, we call it complementary protection. And so uh, the strict criteria for recognizing persecution is and has been the, the important reason for the small number of uh, recognition. Oh, this is another one. Um, I'm, I'm counting number. Um, what is the um, time left? I have five more minutes. Lack of understanding of uh, foreign um, refugee issues. Um, this is a um, cabinet of survey. And the respondent said, we have too many refugees. We have too many refugees and we should accept the less. Why? Security concerns are the reason. So there's a lot of misunderstanding about the refugees and um, people mix up refugees with migrants. Uh, you see, this is an um, ad um, in the train beauty, lotion, refugees. There are millions of refugees in Japan. But now, reform of the asylum system is going on. First is that um, the ISA is compiling the first ever refugee status determination guidelines. And the complementary protection is being introduced based on the um, international laws such as torture convention. And country of origin information is being improved. And uh, um, did I miss any slide? Um, let me mention the recent development as regards the, the special measure for Myanmar nationals. Um, there'll be um, a kind of um, a blanket uh, amnesty for all Myanmar um, nationals who want to stay in Japan. Um, the 3,000 refugees application will be processed very quickly and people who are not granted refugee status will be allowed to stay and work in Japan. 
And you may know, you know that this uh, famous player, Pierre Liang Ong, the government had already mentioned that he would be approved as a refugee, which is very unusual in Japan. And ISA Commissioner Sasaki said, we shall um, overhaul the detention um, policy, uh, which, which also affects the um, asylum system. But in China, which is very important, uh, resettlement program has been expanded and uh, will be uh, expanded further. Uh, this uh, new initiative, uh, scholarship, um, accepting refugees as uh, students, not necessarily as refugees, has been going on for some time. Although the number is uh, still limited, probably a total of 500 is a significant development. And here, um, civil society organizations have been involved. Financial contributions, which is very important, I have to um, stress, it's very important. And Japan has been playing an important role in this. It's not only the government, the private um, sector, for example, the Japan for UNHCR, UNHCR Kyokai, collected uh, 53 million dollars, 53 million dollars last year from 200,000 individuals and uh, donated um, 40 million, uh, no, this is 50 million, 50 some million dollars to UNHCR. And other NGOs like World Vision and um, say, um, um, Mission Sun Frontier are uh, also collecting money. So probably the total amount of money raised for refugees in Japan last year would be $100 million, with which millions of people will be assisted and helped. So, um, so Japan's com comparative advantage is its financial contributions as a form of burden sharing or responsibility sharing, helping millions of the displaced people. Conclusion. Um, Japan's asylum system is being improved, and Japan's burden sharing or responsibility sharing is uh, expanding and diversifying. The last word, the role of the youth. You have to promote understanding of the refugee, refugee issues in Japan. There are so many ignorance, there has been so many misunderstanding about the refugees and migrants. Second is, um, second is, oh, oh. Last, last right. second is that uh, the issue of refugees is very complex and entail humanitarian, social, economic, and political dimensions, and this must be kept in mind. Asylum with um, refugee issues is not only asylum, but, uh, but it's a very complex issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Takizawa, uh, for a very informative uh, um, informative presentation. Um, now I'm very happy to uh, invite Ms. Kadiza Begum, a graduate student at School of Asia Pacific Studies at Waseda University. I'm very happy to see you after all uh, that I'm hearing about you. So please, you have the floor. いただき、え、誠にありがとうございます。え、今日私のバックグラウンドや難民としての私の、え、日本での生活のあらゆるところを、え、皆さんにえ、お話ししたいと思います。え、今から少し<笑> お国はどこですか?え、異国に住む外国人がよく聞かれる質問ですが、え、その人のえ、アイデンティティそのものです。え、
。およそ千年以上の歴史を持つとされる少数民族の品画なんですが、宗教、言葉、えー、文化の違いで、えー、ミャンマーの軍事政権による、えー、長年あの迫害と差別を受けていました、えー。現在、世界で一番迫害を受けているというふうにされています。えー国民として認められず、飲食住や教育の制限、宗教と移動の自由を奪われ、命からから各国へ難民として避難する様子で、ロヒンガ人によく知られています。日本にも90年代から2000年初代から保護を求めて難民が来日しています。えー、現在、約200人ぐらいの変化が在日していまして、難民認定されたのが20人、植物在留資格が100人ぐらいで、10人ぐらいが仮放免、で数,人数人が収容されています。こちらのロヒンガの難民の約9割が群馬県立林市に住んでいます。えーとはい、私の場合なんですが、えー、少数民族の品画の石であった父が、えー、政治活動を理由に見に危険を,見に危険を感じ、バングラデシュに避難しました。私の生まれはその後でしたが、バングラデシュは私にとって全く安全な国でもありませんでした。えー、バングラデシュでは、えー、子どもたちが教育を受けられず、えー、難民キャンプに住まなければいけない,い,けないです。難民キャンプに、えー、住むことになると、子どもの将来が、えー、台無しになる、そういう恐れをした父は、えー、ロヒンガであることを隠し、バングラデシュ人になりすまして、えー、バングラデシュに住むことを選びました。<笑>えー、とバングラデシュでは、えー、ロヒンガであることを正体がばれてしまうといつでもあのミャンマーに送還されてしまうという恐れがあったので、えー、危機感をずっと感じながらなんとか高校バングラデシュの高校を卒業することができましたその後医学部を、えー、進学することを目指してましたが、えー、とバングラデシュでは、えー、それがすごく難しく、えーバ変化であることをバレてしまうと、えー、危険であること、危険なので、えーとえー、進学を断念しました。その後ですね、ちょうどその年、す、え、で、ー、にロヒンガで難民として認定されている夫と結婚が決まり、2006年12月30日に来日することができました。これがバングラデシュの難民キャンプの様子で、まあ、難民キャンプの子どもたちの様子です。これが私、来日した初日の写真です。<笑>日本に来て自分は国籍どこですかってよく聞かれますが、ちゃんと答えられない私にはステータスオフィスに難民というアイデンティティがあります。えー、と難民だというと、えー、皆さんには、えー、遠,遠,い国から遠い国の戦争場から逃れた貧しい人々の、えー、様子を浮かべるかもしれないんですけど、彼らもあの皆さんと同じ人間であり、えー、笑い、食べ、喜ぶ、悲しむ、えー、同じ人間です。教育の機会があれば難民,も難民の方々も可能性に向かって頑張れるはず。彼らは難民を受け入れた国の負担ではなく、さまざまな形で貢献できる力を持っていると信じています。そのため、一番大事だと思ったのは教育を受けることです。教育を受けることで、初めて一人の難民は自分の状況を周りに発信することができますし、できることがたくさん増えて彼らのエンパワーメントにもつながります。ロヒンガ難民として私は難民問題に興味,あ興味があり、ロヒンガ難民問題へ貢献できるように、えーえー、研究者になることが有名でした。そのため勉強がしなければならない、えー、だけど、えー、日本では物価が高くて、えー、どうやって、えー、勉強しようかというふうに悩みがありました。そこで、えー、日本の国が私に提供したのが RSQ 支援センターという6ヶ月間の、えーなえー、日本語と生活基礎を学ぶ機会でした。そのあ RSQ 支援センターの6ヶ月の期間が私のすべ、えー、ての、えーまあ、人生の
、うん、始まりの一歩でした、えー、そこで6年6ヶ月間学んでからさらに勉強したいというあの希望を伝えたところで、えー、さらに日本語を勉強するために、えー、新宿日本語学校を紹介していただきました、えー、1年一人しか7割免除で、えー、受け入れないんですけど私はその試験を合格して、えー、7割学費免除でさらに2年間勉強していきたいを言いましたその後ですねちょうどあ難民あ高等教育プログラムに参加しましてえー、ひとあ私、この年一人あの、私が受かりましたが、えー、2009年、えーと、青山学院大学ですね、総合文化政策学部に入学し、えー、2013年卒業しました。その後あの3年生の時に、えー、イヌクロがやっている難民の、えー、雇用プログラムですね。インターンシッププログラムに参加しまして、えー、入社することができました。あ卒業後は、えー、立林に、えー、引っ越すことになりまして、えー、群馬県立林に引っ越すことになりまして、えー、仕事も立林に行くので移動することになりました。<笑>私は日本語で話せて仕事もしてたので、さまざまな問題が、あ問題に出会っても、大体一人でどこでも行けて、子育てもあまり問題はなかったんですが、あの周りにいる人間の女性たちはそうではありませんでした。えー、彼らがあの外国人として、あるいは難民として出会った課題のほとんどが、えー、ここに4つにまとめました。難しい日本語、高い物価と高い学費、どこでも必要な、えー、保証人と、えーまあ、不安定の就労です。子供あ女性たちは日本語がしゃべれないのであの外,をどこ外を行けずずっと家にいる生活をしていますで。あと、物価が高いので男性は、うん、長い時間外で働かなければならないです。で勉強がわからないことで子供たちの、えー、学習、うんがかなり課題であって、えー、子どもたちもお母さんお父さんが日本語がわからないことでよくあの嫌な思いをすることがあります。えそういったところであのそういった状況からロヒンガの女性たちそして子どもたちを少しでもあ助けたいという気持ちから私は教育支援活動をあいろんな教育に関するいろんな活動に関わりました。これは女性の日本語の教室とか、あの小学から高校生の学習支援、病院や学校でロヒンガの,あの通訳を手伝いなどをや,ってやりました。えー、そ,その時の,あの様子です。えー、とそしてあのもう一つやったのが、あの立林の,あの公民館とかで,です、ね、交流場として公民館を利用しましたあの。自分たちの文化や宗教、そして食べ物を紹介したり、一般,子ど一般市民とあの関わり場としてつながりました。<笑>えー、とロヒンガ問題はあの世界問題に結びついているので、えー、これらの問題どうやってあの解決するかあどうやってあのその問題整理するかなどをさらに学ぶために今回はあの大学入学することを決めました今回も、えー、アーリスクシンセンあ,あの難民行動教育プログラムに参加しまして、えー、早稲田大学、大学のアジア太平洋研究科ですね、えー、2000年4月から入学しました。まずあの、世界的な視野を持ち、えー、日本を含むアジアでのロヒンガの難民問題に貢献できるように、えーまあ、ロヒンガ難民が多く存在する東南アジア、南アジアなどの歴史、政治、経済。産業、経営、文化などを学びたいと思っています。えーとまあ、ロヒンガ難民であっても、えー、私たちは、えーまあのみんな、皆さんとあの同じように可能性を持っていて、夢があって、えーえー、と国や人々のためになる力があると私は信じています。そのためにあの、えー、周りの支援
、そしてこのサポートがすごく必要です。えー、現在、日本ではあのいろんなサポートがあるんですけど、ただまだまだそれがすごく足りない。えー、もちろんね、RCQ シーセンターみたいな6ヶ月間の素晴らしい機会がありますけど、でもさらに大学とかいい仕事を見つけるためにその機会がすごくあの足りないですし、えー、大学とか行ける機会もすごく少ないと思います。また難民を積極的に雇用してくれる会社もすごく少ないのでそういったサポートをもっともっと増やさないといけないです。で私は私の子,あの子供2人と夫家族4人で、えー、日本で頑張っていきたいと思いますしこれから難民のイメージが悪いというところから、うん、よくするため、えー、日々頑張っていろんなことを挑戦していきたいと思います。時間ちょっと超えてしまいましたが、ご清聴ありがとうございます。Thank you, thank you very much, Kadiza さん、um, for a life story, really.、Um, so, in these keynote speeches, we've heard from Professor Takizawa, who highlighted recent policy development and the reasons for a、um, small number of refugees being granted refugee status in Japan. And、uh, one of them being persecution is、uh, very difficult to prove.、Um, however, he、uh, highlighted that there are other sort of alternative pathways where、uh, people are granted、um, status to stay in Japan under humanitarian status,、um, students, and other means. Um, Kadiza san gave us life story as a member of Rohingya community uh, from, uh, and, your, and your family's story、uh, from Myanmar, Bangladesh, and in Japan. And、uh, I think we should take her message that、uh, refugees are、uh, people who have full potential, dreams, and power. So,、um, thank you very much for this powerful statement. And、uh, now, before in,、uh, introducing the young leaders,、um, I would just like to remind the audience、um, if,、uh, if you have questions, please do send us through chat, where, and I can,、uh, we can take it at the end in the QA session. Okay,、um, now I would like to introduce our youth leaders who will give us statements. Um, I will introduce、uh, one by one. So,、um, we have three youth leaders who are willing to give statements. And the first one is from Students Think Aloud for Refugees, STARS,、um, Kojina Tsumugi san,、uh, who is a co representative of STARS. So,、um, please,、uh, Kojina san, you have the floor. Hi, Koshokai, a r i g a t o g a i m a s 画面共有の方をさせていただきます。あ、改めまして皆様こんにちは。長崎大学学生団体スターズです。本日はこのような機会をいただき誠にありがとうございます。今回パネリストを務めさせていただきます長崎大学学生団体スターズ副代表の小島つむぎと申しますどうぞよろしくお願いいたします今回のイベントは難民支援に携わる方々が世代に関係なくこれまでの活動経験を共有し今後の難民支援について考えていくという趣旨だと伺っております実は我々スターズは2019年に発足したばかりのまだまだ若い団体です私自身、難民問題についてあまり知らない状態から団体運営に携わり、ようやく2年が経つ程度の知識の浅い人間で、えー、あまり物足りない部分、多々あるかもしれませんが、えー、これまでの私たちの活動がですね、少しでも皆様にとって難民支援のあり方の幅を広げるきっかけになるよう、一生懸命発表させていただきますので、どうぞよろしくお願いいたし最後まで、えー、お付き合いお願いいたします。まず、スターズの設立経緯からお話しさせていただきます。スターズは2019年に長崎大学でウィルツーリブ難民映画上映会を開催するために学生たちが集まり設立された団体になっております。ウィルツーリブ難民映画上映会とはですね、難民問題をテーマとしてあテーマとした映画を上映し、難民の皆さんが直面している過酷な現実、そしてその中で見出す希望など、
難民の方一人一人の物語を発信することを目指し、えー、目的として、UNHCR 協会が2006年から開催しているイベントです。このイベントを学校パートナーズという形で開催する、長崎大学でも開催するために、えー、スターズは発足しました。スターズという団体名は、Student Think Around for Refugees の頭文字を取ったものです。難民問題に対して考え、あ、失礼しました。難民問題に対し,、えー、対し考え、声を上げる学生たちという団体名を冠しているだけあり、私たちが常に大切にしていることは、知ることから私たちにできることを考えるという過程です。この理念を実行するため、スターズは2020年からさまざまな活動を行ってまいりました。昨年の世界難民の日には、食べ知る難民のご飯もぐもぐウィークというイベントを企画しました。このイベントでは難民の、メンバーが難民の方の出身地域の料理を作り、そして食べるということから難民問題について知るきっかけを作り、その様子を SNS で発信しました。同じ時期に難民問題に関わる学生たちの交流の場であるユースかける u n i シ c i a l for r に参画し、難民問題に携わる学生たちの思いを紙飛行機に飛ばす紙飛行機プロジェクトにも参加しました。2020年度の後半には自分たちが難民についてより深く知る必要があると考え、いくつかのテーマで勉強会を開催しました。そして今年4月には新,月新型コロナウイルスの影響で延期が続いたウィルツーリブ難民映画上映会を2年越しにオンラインで開催することができ、100名以上の方にご参加いただきました。はい、今年の難民あ世界難民の日にはです、ね、長崎にある大村入管、そして入管法改正について学生たちのみでディスカッションを行う、長崎から難民を考えるというイベントを開催しました。このイベントでは入管,法、えー、入管法改正案に対する賛成、反対、さまざまな意見が飛び交う昨今の情勢の中で、両者の意見をまず理解すること、それぞれの意見に向き合うことこそが、共生へとつながるのではないかという考えを、参加者の皆様と共有することができた,のでできたのではないかと感じています。入管法改正案取り下げの中で、首都圏を中心に学生たちが改正反対運動に多く参加している姿がありましたしかし日本に2つある入国管理センターのうち大村入管ではまだまだ支援の手が足りず入管問題について活発に考える団体も少ないのが長崎の実情ですスターズも未だ大きなムーブメントにつなげられるほどの具体的な活動はまだできておりませんどこにいても私たちはつながり、難民問題解決に向けて動ける余地はまだまだあると思っております。長崎にいるからこそ伝えられること、声を上げること、私たちが暮らすこの社会で何が起こっているのかを、本日ご参加の皆様とも一緒に考え、行動につなげていくことを今後の展望としております。スターズはですね、SNS アカウントを通じて、これまでの活動内容、今後の活動について、より発信し、より深くスターズの活動についてご理解いただけると思いますので、もしよろしければアクセスしてみてください。本日はお時間いただきありがとうございました。Thank you very much, Kojina さん、for a very interesting introduction of STARS activities. I feel that it is focused on five senses that young people have more than our generation. Okay, so let me、uh, introduce the next、uh, youth leader who will、um, give us a statement. Mr. Satoshi Yanaizu, he's a student and youth leader at Harvard University. So、uh, please, Yanaizu san, you have the floor. Thank you. Am I, am I audible? Thank you.、Uh, thank you, Professor Kihara Hunt, for your introductions and for the UNMGC Wide Japan Working Group for Migrations for hosting this informative panel. Uh, my name is Satoshi Yanaizu, and I'm a Japanese undergraduate student at Harvard College studying international politics and political philosophy. Today, I would like to say a few words on what I consider as a desirable way forward for supporting refugees in Japan.、Um, obviously, I'm not an expert on the subject, and any talk of substantive policy issues might sound superficial or ungrounded in real world complexities.、Um, nevertheless, following the recent debate on the amendment to the immigration law, Or the deaths of Sri Lanka women at the detention facility that sparked public outcry, and the persistently no, low number of refugee resettlements and asylum acceptance in Japan, some reforms indeed seem urgent. This includes one, separation between border control agencies 
and the agency in charge of asylum applications. Two, are interpretations of refugees' definitions under the Refugee Convention that is more aligned with international practices and standards. And three, more generous and tailored government support for refugees and those waiting for the applications, especially in education and social integrations. The economists estimate in 2019 that the fifth of immigrant children in Japan might not be attending school due to a lack of academic or paperwork support, and I assume the situation isn't any better for the refugee children. However, I'd like to take this opportunity to think about what each of us as individuals can do to support refugees in Japan and move our national conversation forward, even if you do not know a single refugee living in your city or in your area. Japan accepts a starkly fewer number of refugees than other comparable economies. Yet we're the second largest donor to the UN Refugee Agency, um, contributing $126 million last year. In trying to make sense of this inconsistency, I can't help attributing this to an implicit limit placed on our solidarity. There seems to exist a widespread feeling among us, which is translated into national politics that the foreigners arriving at our airports, desperate for help or, and fearful of prosecutions are not necessarily our own problem, but a problem elsewhere that we may or may not extend the support with money. Many of us, including myself, tend to have little regard for those who come from a different walks of life, both at home and abroad. The difference in our skin color, nationality and languages is a prime example of the barrier to our sympathy and imaginations. When I was born in Nagano Prefecture in 2000, I did not have a Japanese passport. My parents immigrated from China to Japan in the 1990s, and the whole family naturalized in Japan after I was born. And my parents once spoke to me, somewhat unwittingly, about persistent discriminations and misunderstanding that the foreigner had to go through in Japan during their era such as not being told about overtime pay or accident insurance while working part-time at a local bakery. I used to think that the social integrations of refugees and migrants is somewhat a distant issue for me, but these experiences told me that with a matter of luck, I could have been a migrant, I could have been a migrant struggling to make life here in Japan or asylum seeker who's not even allowed to stay in this country. We can support refugees in Japan by pursuing a more tolerant society. This is not to say that to support refugees in Japan, we should internationalize our country by making all students speak English or study abroad. On the contrary, the fellow feeling and the humility that we're all in this together and someone's struggle could have been our struggle need to be nurtured at, at home, need to be nurtured at, at home, classroom and workplace. As the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbates socioeconomic inequality everywhere, our social bonds and democratic solidarities are in danger. Even if you alone can't immediately alter national policies on, migra on migrations and on refugees, we can begin by trying to be a little more sensitive to other people's suffering, especially those who don't look like us or think like us. This is indeed a never end ending and this is indeed a never ending and challenging enterprise, and I don't intend to pretend that I have mastered the art of sympathy. But one good thing about being used is that we'll still have plenty of time to try and error. I believe the collection of these small steps combined with the campaigns to raise awareness about refugees on various platforms, just as to be heard from previous speaker, can mobilize more people, change politics, and improve refugees' life in Japan in the future. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, Satoshi-san, for a powerful statement um, that acknowledges somebody's struggle as everybody's struggle and trying to think about other people's suffering. Okay, and um, now um, I think uh, um, I can invite uh, Mr. Daiki Yoshioka. He's a youth leader and uh, he, he's a youth leader who is providing a statement on this uh, very important forum. So um, without further ado, Daiki-san, you have the floor. Um, before sharing my remark, I want to thank all the speakers for sharing their insights and experiences. It is such a pleasure to join this session. It was a year ago, right before the coronavirus pandemic hit New York, I came back to Tokyo from the United States, where I was pursuing my bachelor's degree. Since then, I've been working at a multinational company in Tokyo called Alpha Sites, where 40% of my teammates are foreign residents. My past experiences overseas as a foreign resident 
and my current experience of working with foreign colleagues made me reflect a lot on the future of Japanese society. Today, I'd like to share some pieces of my reflection. Social issues in Japan, namely its homogeneity, the necessity to not only accept more refugees, but to create a more inclusive and diverse environment to move the society forward and to make sure that every member of Japanese society has equitable resources. First off, let me start with the social problems in Japan. And as we all know, there are a lot of pressing issues in Japan, ranging from the aging society, deflation, stagnated wage growth, LGBTQ rights. But what really struck me when I came back to Japan is how we're slow in terms of accepting foreign residents, especially refugees. According to the Immigration Services Agency in Japan, only 2% of the entire Japanese population is foreign residents in 2019 with even lower representation of refugees. Imagine every 50 people you encounter on the street, only one person is a foreign resident, and it's even lower for refugees. While the world is getting more globalized and nations offer helping hands to those in struggles at the same citizens on earth, we're still living in a closed box. But why is this happening? I believe that we're still living in the us and them world. From my experience of growing up in Japan, I noticed that the societal notion of being Japanese is closely tied to three conditions. One, to be born in Japan. Two, to speak Japanese fluently. And three, to look like Japanese. We still think of foreign residents as outsiders as the word gaijin illustrates. There are plenty of examples. While getting close to friends from overseas, I learned horrific episodes. Getting denied to join the gym, legal documents are all in Japanese, being stopped by the police officers for no reason. Especially for refugees, for more vulnerable, this kind of treatment and mistrust might evoke trauma and fear. Moreover, it adds high cost for refugees for escaping from severe challenges in the home country and wish to build a new life in Japan as people who have been granted a second chance. To me, it is clear that the Japanese society still doesn't fully embrace and grasp the power of diversity. However, diversity helps us to move Japanese society forward. According to the MIT Sloan, immigrants 80% more likely start their own business. Numerous studies show that immigrants as a whole fuel the economy and increase productivity and GDP. Even from my own experience at the workplace, I've seen more creative solutions as people from different cultural backgrounds chip in their thoughts and ideas. Beyond the economic merits, we should shed the traditional thinking of us and them. We should encourage Japanese people especially use to build connection with the international community. We should encourage Japanese teachers to educate globalism to the next generations. We should involve everyone to create a more diverse and tolerant workplace in Japan. To summarize, there are a lot of pressing issues in Japan that the traditional monocultural identity cannot address. On top of that, other countries actively help those in need are the same citizens on this planet. I believe we need to welcome our friends from overseas, whether they're international students, foreign workers, or refugees, as equal members of society. As one use living in the Japanese society, I believe we need to discard traditional thinking and to create a more diverse and inclusive environment here in Japan and to progress humanity together. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Taiki-san, for um, uh, problems, uh, highlighting problems that are uh, rooted in the traditional monocultural idea of Japanese and uh, you know the need for uh, imagining what it is like for non-Japanese in a traditional way. 
Okay, um, now we have a Q&A for a few minutes um, and I would like to take uh, Hinako-san's question that is posted on chat. So um, with all society approach, political will seems to be a barrier to having a real functioning all stakeholder approach. So what do you think are necessary for uh, responsibility sharing in this regard? Um, we have one, two, three, four, five speakers. So maybe uh, like um, who, who would like to go first um, and together with your closing remark, maybe a um, few, few sentences. Um, should we start with the uh, Takizawa sensei, but it's a uh, half, half a minute per person or something. But would you like to start? Uh, minutes to answer this um, difficult question. It's um, um, the um, problem of um, um, who should provide um, international good, a public global, uh, public goods. And uh, there's no um, international agreement on this. And the refugee issues is, um, in fact, suffering from the lack of uh, agreement on the responsibility to global, um, public, global public good sharing mechanism. Um, the first is, particularly for the youth, to understand that this is the issue of global public goods. The production and sharing of the global public goods. And I would suggest that you study the issue from um, this perspective, rather economic perspective. The issue of, um, of refugees has been too much dominated by the legal argument, who is a refugee? But the, the scale of the problem is too big for legal um, staff or lawyers to solve. It must be addressed politically and uh, economically. And I would suggest young people to look at it from economic perspective, economic solutions. And this is what um, uh, would um, um, uh, open a new um, debate, new field of studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Takizawa. Uh, could I um, hear from, uh, could we hear from Kadiza-san? Would you have any comments? Kadiza-san, would you like to go next? Maybe while Kadiza-san is getting ready, um, could I hear maybe from Kojina-san? Would you like to go and have just a few sentences? Okay, maybe there is a problem. Um, okay, um, would uh, Daiki-san or Yanaizu-san want to make a few remarks? Uh, yes, I can say a few words combined with the concluding remarks. Uh, yeah, I think um, the Japan, the Japanese people in general don't think that they don't have a responsibility to contribute to global public goods. Japan has been the largest supporter for ASEAN country in its development. For example, uh, one of the largest uh, disclosed uh, supporter for Myanmar in terms of economic development and also Japan has doing something that's things like sending vaccine to those countries but I think what differentiates supporting refugees from those uh, sort of economic type of support is that like it, it just is just about sending money and doesn't constitute it doesn't involve some sort of a, uh, changes on our way of life so I think what we should really do is to move away from this idea of like Japan supporting and other countries other people being supported and really think about um, refugees as a part of a community, part of our society, a productive and respected member of a society. And I think you also, uh, given that the other country who are active in supporting refugees, country like US or Canada, have a history of migrants playing a central role in the formation of the society. And Japan, as some of the speakers has mentioned, has, has more been thought of as being a homogenous country, but we should really begin by uh, changing that conception so that the, the population became, becomes more interested 
in the issue so that they can um, amass political will to continue the sort of policies. So I, I don't think that the, so we should think of refugees as a burden, although the term burden sharing suggests some sort of connotation, but really think about what we can do to make every person realize the potentials and how Japan can play a role in that while benefiting from the refugees as well. Thank you very much, Satoshi-san. Um, I think um, the time has actually passed. So um, if uh, Kadida-san or uh, Daiki-san wishes to make a very brief closing remarks, um, I would like to accommodate that. But otherwise, maybe we should uh, close it here. Um, I am aware that uh, I have not been perfect in managing time and it's two minutes over the schedule. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for this very interesting conversation. It is really significant this, that this United Nations major group for children and youth facilitate these kind of conversations um, across generations, across countries, and I think the messages were heard from many different uh, um, different perspectives. And one thing that we seem to share is that we all need to do a little bit more than we are doing. So uh, with that uh, final remarks, I would like to thank everybody who uh, made a speech and also who participated. And also I do see comments in the chat. So thank you very much for very precious comments and your participation. With this, we would like to close. Thank you very much. <laughs>